What's up you juggernaut heathens? Dr. James Hoffman here, and I'm gonna to talk to you guys today about one of my favorite topics, recovery. And this time we're gonna talk about some common myths and mistakes for recovery and hypertrophy training. There is all sorts of crazy bullshit out there on recovery stuff, so let's take a look at some of my favorite ones where people get it wrong. Number one on this list today, using heat and cold for hypertrophy training. So a lot of people like to use the ice bath or they are big Joe Rogan fanboys, so they spend most of their day in a sauna or doing something similar. And what have we found? Well, it turns out heat and cold can actually be pretty useful in a lot of settings, sporting settings, for example, because more often than not, they help you recover some of your exercise performance a little bit more quickly but they do tend to come at a bit of a cost, and that's usually how much adaptation that you would get from the training that you did. Now, for hypertrophy training specifically, this means actually getting less growth from your sessions. Ugh, I couldn't think of a worse scenario, right? So unfortunately for hypertrophy training, we're not so concerned about shortening the recovery timeline so that we can train super, super, super hard necessarily in the next session, only because we don't need to train all that super hard. The problem then is if we use these things all the time, then we're just gonna be losing incrementally more and more muscle mass over time from what we would have gotten. So that's no good, right? So there's definitely a significant trade-off. Another problem that we see with hot and cold and hypertrophy training is kind of a false positive problem where some of these things can have an analgesic effect, meaning they make you hurt less. Sometimes they just make you feel better. They have perceptive effects where you just feel really good, like especially if you take like a warm bath or something like that, but it's not actually gonna help you get back to that hypertrophy training in the way that you need, which is to really grow more muscle, right? So in this case, we're gonna be getting a lot of false positives, thinking that we're feeling great, though we probably are not where we need to be. So I think it's good in limited use, right? If you're having a bad day or you wanna enjoy a nice hot bath or maybe spend a little bit of time in the sauna, every now and again, not a huge deal. It might actually be okay in the acute sense. In the long-term chronic sense, this is not something you wanna be doing or relying on as a staple recovery strategy for your hypertrophy program. Again, in some sporting settings, this is actually a good idea, but for hypertrophy specifically, not a good idea. Quit being a Joe Rogan fanboy. Let's talk about some other ones. Supplements, heed my words. There is no magic pill or powder for recovery. The only magic pills and powders for recovery that I can think of are steroids and meth, and those are sacred, so we're gonna leave them alone. But realistically, there's no powder, there's no pill, there's nothing over the counter that you're gonna get that's going to help you recover, right? It's just not gonna happen. So a lot of times we'll see things like BCAAs, glutamine, all these different kinds of herbs, vitamins, mineral supplements, all these things, recovery drinks, all of it is mostly nonsense. If it doesn't have carbs, if it doesn't have protein in it, it ain't doing anything for recovery. So the reality is most of the supplements that we look at are mostly useless, right? Now you can look at things like carb powders, protein powders, and those things are fine, right? And they fall under the same macronutrient recommendation stuff that we would see for food. So in the context of a good, well-controlled diet for the most part, none of these supplements, none of these over-the-counter pills and stuff are gonna do anything for you. Just throw them right into the garbage, it's not for recovery. Don't bother with it. Another one that we see a lot, myofascial release. This is when people are spending a lot of time doing the foam roller or using like the dildo gun on themselves for hours at a time. We don't need to be doing that. In fact, get off of that foam roller. Well, it turns out it doesn't really do much for recovery at all. In fact, most of the studies show no effect when they look at these things in the context of recovery. Some of these things can be really useful in, for improving range of motion. So it can allow you to train in a slightly fuller range of motion, which is its own distinct benefit, but has nothing to do with recovery. So unfortunately, if we're not trying to improve range of motion, then we really don't need to be using those things at all. You can basically say, no thanks. So we see a lot of people spending like hours and hours and hours at the gym, dildo gunning, foam rolling, Get out of there. You don't need to do that unless you're having mobility issues. Next, cupping. Folks, this one drives me bananas. There's no scientific basis for the use of cupping, right? We can't even explain a possible mechanism for why it would do anything. In fact, when you see people who do cupping, they're usually covered in bruises and or burns. That's the opposite of recovery. It's the complete opposite. Get that shit out of my face. Moving on. Relaxation pods and sensory deprivation chambers. These things are really cool and interesting and they tend to look kind of fun and sexy. You'll see them at like the UFC Performance Institute and some other places, but what's really going on there? Well, it turns out there's really nothing going on there. 
Anything like a sensory deprivation chamber or recovery pod is really just taking the benefit of relaxation, which is its own recovery strategy in itself, right? So there's nothing fancy going on there. It's the same relaxation that you could do anywhere else, right? Have you heard of uh, Netflix and chill? How about Netflix and pizza? That's even better, right? So keep in mind, there's nothing fancy going on there. These things are just another way of implementing relaxation. If you like to do that, that's fine, but just think of it that it's nothing that you couldn't do on the couch in your own home. Massage is another one that drives me bananas. This one is really, really prone to making what we call type one errors, a false positive, where you go and get a massage, you feel better, and you think, I must be a lot more recovered right now. I can go back and start training hard. Eh, wrong. What have we found on massage? Well, it turns out there doesn't seem to be any real significant, if any at all, physical effects of massage. Most of the effects seem to be psychological and perceptive. So when you go and get a massage done, it will make you feel better. And we've all experienced that. It's very pleasant, really nice, but it doesn't actually improve any of the biomarkers or performance markers for recovery. So you get a false sense of recovery in a sense, right? So essentially what we see is no major physical effects of massage. It can have a psychological effect, which is good, but a lot of it can also be explained by doing other things like relaxation strategies. So nothing too fancy there. Really stop being a creep. I know you just want to get people to put your hands all over you. Cut it out. It's gross. You don't need to do that, right? So really when it comes to hypertrophy training, there's only a few things that actually matter and a lot of nonsense. So if we're going to stick to some basic things, folks, train within your volume landmarks. If you're trying to get jacked, Make sure you're training between your MEV and your MRV. That's probably the most important thing. Train within those volume landmarks. Next, make sure you're getting enough sleep. If you're not sleeping a lot, that's going to be the next major choke point that you have to fix. Eat decently, right? If you're not getting enough protein, not getting enough calories, not getting enough carbs to meet your goals, these are going to be huge major hurdles. And then just don't live a shit lifestyle, right? If you are stressed out all the time, if you are out going out partying, not getting enough sleep, doing lots of drugs, Right? These are things that are ultimately going to be holding you back. So you need to make sure that your lifestyle is conducive to the rigors of the hard training that you're doing. Folks, that's it. Don't buy into all this nonsense. Do some research on your own. If you're interested in finding out more on recovery strategies, check out Recovering From Training on our website or on Audible. And you can ask Mike and I questions on RP Plus every week if you like. This is Dr. James Hoffman. Talk to you soon.